Fayetteville, North Carolina is a mid-sized city in southeastern North Carolina, most famous for hosting Fort Bragg, home of the 82nd Airborne Division, and the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Regular airborne jumps and artillery practice ensure this city of 200,000 is anything but quiet. Nor has it been since the days of early settlement in the decades preceding the American Revolution, when Fayetteville was a gateway to North Carolina's backcountry consisting of two townships known as Cross Creek and Campbellton. I'm Frank Brazel, professor of history at Manning University and a PhD student in the history program at Liberty University. In this presentation, we want to discuss the history of the city of Fayetteville and of the surrounding Cumberland County during the 18th and early 19th centuries. From its initial settlement, predominantly by Highland Scots, to the visit of its namesake, the Marquis de Lafayette, 1825. Early settlement in the region that would become Cumberland County began in the 1730s with much of the population emigrating from the Scottish Highlands. They were seeking land and freedom from the Scottish system of land tenure and rents. The increase of rents in Scotland during this period led in turn to increased immigration and in 1730 a landing would be established near the site of modern Fayetteville. This initiated the region's status as a gateway to the North Carolina backcountry. Nestled on the western bank of the Cape Fear River, the villages of Campbellton and Cross Creek provided strategic access to backcountry settlement. The Cape Fear River runs from North Carolina's Piedmont in modern Chatham County to the Atlantic Ocean at the port city of Wilmington. It therefore became a natural highway for those wishing to make the journey inland during the period of 18th century settlement. With Cross Creek, serving as a final waterborne stop for settlers and traders before they made the journey overland into the interior of the colony. When the Royal Government of North Carolina chartered Cumberland County in 1754, splitting it from neighboring Bladen County, they selected a name that would prove to be ironic. Named for Prince William, the Duke of Cumberland, the rotund younger son of King George II, the county's highland and military connections could be cemented. In 1746, Cumberland had been responsible for the end of the Jacobout Rising through his victory at the Battle of Culloden, in which the Stuart claimant of the British Crown, supported by Highland Scots, was defeated. In the decades to come, it would be the Highland Scots who would elect to settle in Cumberland County. Those settling in North Carolina were expected to take a loyalty oath to the king as further assurance that they would not rise again in opposition these immigrants would be supplemented by Highland soldiers whose service in the French and Indian War entitled them to land grants in North Carolina. As the American Revolution drew nearer, divisions occurred as to how the colonists in Cumberland County perceived the British Empire and their place in it. Settlers who had come to North Carolina in the first half of the 18th century tended to have patriots in place as they possessed the means to take care of themselves free from government interference. By contrast, newer immigrants, particularly the Highland Scots, saw in the British government the source of their freedom. For these Scots, possession of their own land, free from tyranny of landlords demanding rent, as they'd experienced in Scotland, was the key element of freedom. The British government was the provider of that freedom. Not all residents of Cumberland County saw things that way. Following the battles at Lexington and Concord in April 1775, Patriot residents of Cumberland County drafted what became known as the Liberty Point Resolves, also called the Cumberland Association, in which those residents declared their willingness to militarily stand against the injustices enacted by the British government. The drafters of the Liberty Point Resolves were clear. They preferred that the Crown and the colonies resolve their issues, but if they did not, they were willing to take up arms against Great Britain. It is notable that while this was not the first of such resolves issued within the colonies, it nonetheless predates the Declaration of Independence by more than a year. Yet it was Loyalist support from the Highlanders which started Cumberland County's military involvement in the American Revolution. Royal Governor Josiah Martin 
sitting off the coast of North Carolina on a Royal Navy ship, was convinced that if he could get the Highlanders of Central North Carolina to rise in favor of the crown, many thousands of other loyalists would soon follow. The goal, as Martin saw it, was to raise sufficient North Carolina loyalist troops to support the impending landing of General Henry Clinton. On January 10, 1776, the governor issued the call to arms. Leading the loyalists now assembling at Cross Creek were two Scottish officers from the regular army, Donald MacDonald and Donald MacLeod, veterans of Bunker Hill. MacDonald was also a veteran of the Battle of Culloden. On February 5, 1776, MacDonald assembled key loyalist leaders at Cross Creek, most of them Highlanders, marking the start of recruitment. As the recruiting campaign faltered, offers of acreage and of the elimination of land debts induced more Highlanders to join the loyalists assembling at Cross Creek. In the end, MacDonald and MacLeod succeeded in recruiting about 1,500 loyalists who began their campaign on February 19th maneuvering around a Patriot force at Rockfish Creek in Cumberland County. This Patriot force had blocked the main route south. The Loyalists instead crossed the river at Campbellton and made towards their main objective at Wilmington. Their advance would be stopped on February 27th at the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge, which culminated in a Highland broadsword charge across the bridge by Loyalist forces. The charge was a failure and resulted in the death of McLeod. The remaining Loyalists began to retreat. Most of the force would be captured, whereafter, most of the enlisted Highlanders from Cumberland County would be paroled and return to their homes with the promise that they would not again take up arms against the Patriots. Cross Creek would remain a strategic point and supply depot along the Cape Fear River for the remainder of the war, but the most important action in the war itself would remain the assembly of the doomed Highland Loyalists in early February. During the Yorktown campaign, the region would be occupied by Continental troops and Patriot militia. In 1778, Cross Creek would combine with Campbellton to form a single polity, which after the war would be renamed Fayetteville in honor of the Marquis de Lafayette, a fabulously wealthy French noble who endeared himself to the American people through his service in the Continental Army. Following the war, the North Carolina General Assembly met first at Hillsborough in Orange County, and there decided not to ratify the newly drafted U.S. Constitution on the grounds that it would not do so until the Constitution was amended to include a Bill of Rights. After more than a year, the General Assembly reconvened in Fayetteville, as North Carolina did not have a permanent capital at that time. In Fayetteville, on November 21, 1789, North Carolina voted to ratify the Constitution. The building in which they agreed to ratify the Constitution will become North Carolina State House prior to the selection of Raleigh as the permanent capital in the following decade. The original building was destroyed by fire in 1831 and was replaced by the Market House, which remains on the site today. With the removal of the capital to Raleigh, Fayetteville would step back in both national and state politics. The city remained accessible by river travel along the Cape Fear, with cargoes traveling downriver to Wilmington frequently. Once again, life in Fayetteville resumed a normal pace. That is, until its namesake elected to visit the city as a part of his wider American tour. On March 4, 1825, he arrived under military escort. Quite a reception greeted the hero Lafayette, who had survived two revolutions to become a living legend on both sides of the Atlantic. Although his welcoming committee insisted that the citizens of Fayetteville were but humble republicans, a ball was thrown that evening in his honor, and the next day before his departure, he performed a review of the local troops present. That evening, a local cavalry escort carried him towards the South Carolina border. During his visit, he was presented with a map of his namesake city, outlining many of the streets as they remain today. Though he only remained in Fayetteville for a day, the echoes of Lafayette's visit remained in Fayetteville for years to come. A final memory of the era in which citizens of Cumberland County and of Fayetteville, both Loyalist and Patriot, played their part in the formation 